to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on topics ranging from Jewish history and the Bible to Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. To find out about David's talks, books, and more, visit davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. Dear listeners, this podcast episode contains a few moments of sound interference. We apologize for any inconvenience this may cause and hope you still enjoy the talk. The period I want to talk about tonight, which is a period that is so formative, no less formative than any of the other periods we've looked at in this series, uh, it's a very condensed period of time between round about 1930, which is where we got up to uh, last week, uh, Monash died last week, if you recall, in around uh, 1931. Um, y- you know, uh, the Burke Street Shul has moved to Turak. Um, uh, that period, uh, you know, Sir Isaac Isaacs has been made Governor General. Uh, that period we got up to, which is the real the culmination of that golden age. But tonight I'm looking at from 1930 to. 1960. Now I know some of you are going saying, oh, but what about the last 50, 60 years? We want to know about that. The reason I'm going up to the early 60s, and I will touch upon things beyond that, I will touch upon things beyond that, but the reason I'm going up to the 19, early 1960s is because really it is my contention that, and the contention of others, that by the time you get to round about the early 1960s, the basic communal institutional infrastructure of Australian Jewry is more or less in place as the framework that we have it now. And we are getting closer to our own time. I'm going to be talking about people that some of you will have actually met. Historical figures that you will have actually met. I know that there are a couple of people that I'm going to mention tonight who I met when I was very young. Uh, That is a difficult proposition because the granularity both of the recentness of the period I want to talk about tonight and of the condensement of that period means that I can really only talk about the highlights. I can't talk about everyone and everything. So some of you most definitely are going to be sitting here going, I can't believe he didn't mention this, or I can't believe he didn't mention that. And you need to remember what it's like to distill this in an hour and a half. I have read a lot on this period over the years. But just to give you an example, to give you an example of the difficulty of distilling the material from a period so recent and so condensed. In the 1950s, there was a wave of immigration to Australia of Egyptian Jews. Anyone familiar with that? Some of you might know. About 2,000 Jews came from Egypt. Yep. That tiny, small fact, a PhD was written on that within the last 15 years. Do you understand that the closer things are, the more material we have and the more difficult it is to distill? I know I'm giving this long introduction, but I have to by way of an apology because I'm going to talk about a period that's very recent. I know that 1960 might not seem so recent for some of us, but it's very recent in historical terms. However, I, I, I want to start by, uh, look, I haven't talked a lot Uh, in this series so far. I've mentioned a little bit, but I haven't talked a lot about the religious and spiritual leaders of our community, of Australian Jewish history. And we have had some remarkable rabbis and spiritual leaders in this country. I did mention that one of the things that certainly by the golden age, Australian Jewry was not necessarily contributing towards was Torah, and international scholarship. But in the period that we're going to talk about tonight, that kind of changes a bit. But overall, we are talking about leaders in a period that is transitioning out of the history that we have spoken about before, where communal representation and communal governance was all about the synagogue. It was the synagogues that were running the community, 
and representations to government and the press and other public bodies was made either by the president of the congregation, who was a very distinguished layperson, or the rabbi himself. Communities were seen as... Uh, seen really as conglomerates of synagogues. This is a very important point because it's an important philosophical point going forward in this period. One of the great debates we're going to look at in this period that is sharply focused in this period and has many ramifications is the question, is Judaism a faith? Or is it a nationality? It's a very big question and it's going to emerge very impactfully in the period we're going to talk about. Therefore, all of the rabbis who were present and affect this period are important. But I want to talk about six. Now, some of you who are very learned about this period will go, oh, that's not the six I would have chosen. But the six I've chosen are representative, and obviously in the context of this talk, I can only talk about them for a couple of minutes. But if we are going to familiarise ourselves with 1930 to 1960 in Australian Jewish history, all of these rabbis, fascinating as they are, are the ones that we would really want to understand as people, but also what their mission, what they represented, and what they achieved. And the first rabbi I want to talk about is actually a rabbi that was the rabbi in the town where I spent most of my childhood. And that was a very influential rabbi called Rabbi David Isaac Friedman. Now Rabbi Friedman arrived in Perth in 1897 as a 25-year-old, 23, 24-year-old actually, he arrived just in time for the consecration of the New Perth Synagogue. And he, although he was born in Hungary, he was educated in that Anglo model from Jews College, the idea of the classic English rabbi that would come out. But by 1900, it became clear that Friedman also had his ear to various international movements that were going on, because unlike any other of those Anglo rabbis in, in, in Sydney and in Melbourne, in 1900, Friedman started the first Zionist organization in Australia. This is remarkable. In 1900, that's only three years after Basel, an organization like that wasn't followed in the eastern states for some years. That's to have a very, very acute nuanced influence on what's subsequently going to follow. Friedman, uh, although he had many job offers, stayed in Perth the next 45 years. I mean, he died in the early 1940s. Uh, he was the rabbi. He started the Perth Hebrew School. My mother studied at that. All my family studied that. All Anybody from Perth, their grandparents, parents or grandparents would have studied uh, under Friedman in the Perth Hebrew School. In 1916-17, he spent in World War I, he was the Jewish chaplain, he was the chaplain for all Jewish servicemen in the Middle East, and uh, came back, he was at Gallipoli, came back and uh, was uh, literally a monument of, of the Perth Jewish community, as were the rabbis of that calibre and category in Melbourne and Sydney as well. And of course, and I'm not just talking about Friedman because of who he was, but because of the type of rabbi he represented. It wasn't just about the Jewish community. He was involved in the Royal Society for this and the Royal Society for that and a patron of the Save the Children Fund, or not, not that it was called, the Royal Society for the Protection of Children, the Royal Society for the Protection of Animals and the Freemasons and the Rotary and any public and the Council of Christians, whatever that form of public work was seen very, very much as a rabbi's role because the rabbi was the ultimate representative of the community. So much so, in fact, that in 1933, I don't know if you heard about it, I don't know if you heard about it, but between the two world wars, there was this thing called the League of Nations. It was a shtickle failure at the end, obviously it was a failure because there was a second world war, 
Uh, but they would meet every thanks. They would meet every couple of years and debate the big international issues of the day. And all countries had representatives at the League of Nations. So in 1933, Rabbi David Friedman represented Australia at the League of Nations conference in Geneva. This was a very important conference. Now, Apocrypha has it, this is a legendary story, but no reason to doubt it. I've researched it and it would seem to be backed up. You know what I'm going to talk about? Is that... He was once to Kevin Rudd and he was amazed. Really? Kevin Rudd was amazed? It is, it is an amazing story because at the League of Nations, all the nations were sitting in alphabetical order. And Australia was sitting next to Alemannia, which of course is Germany. And... David Fr Rabbi Friedman leaned over to the person, the delegate, the German delegate sitting at the desk next to him and said, how do you do? My name's Rabbi David Friedman. I'm the representative of Australia. And the German delegate leaned over and said, my name is Dr. Joseph Goebbels and I am the representative of Germany. Now, <laughs> I've actually seen pictures of Goebbels at that conference and he doesn't look happy having to sit next to a rabbi for, for three days of the conference. But a fascinating story. But to give an example, of that's the kind of caliber of rabbi that was very, very emblematic of, of what rabbis were doing at that stage. Now, of course, when Friedman came back from the war, from the First World War, his successor as chaplain of Jewish servicemen, now this time on the Western Front, is the second rabbi that we would need to understand. And that, of course, was the absolute monument that was Rabbi Edson Kilda Shul for 50 years in the first half of the 20th century, of course, Jacob Danglo. And the thing about Rabbi Danglo is, that, I mean, entire books have been written on Rabbi Danglo, and it would be impossible to summarize his monumental career within a minute. Remember, those of you who would either have met or seen pictures of the rabbis will know. And once again, once again, thematically representative of what rabbis were and what faith was in Australian Jewry. Most of them wore dog collars. Not because they were trying to be Christian per se, but because that's what a minister of the cloth looked like. If the archbishop looked like, if the, if the, if the priest looked like that, and the rabbi looked at that, it doesn't mean that Jews and Christians were the same. It means that's what you were, that's what you wore if you were a religious functionary in Australia in the early 20th century. But Rabbi Danglo, apart from all his achievements, once again on all of these royal societies and representations, but remarkably also an interesting fact that uh, I think it, it tells us a lot about the nature of Melbourne is the fact that it, in 1909... Rabbi Danglo established the Hevra Kadisha for, for Melbourne. Melbourne did not have a Hevra... Now, what's interesting about that is that, as we discussed, in Sydney, the Hevra Kadisha was the first thing that they established in 1817. Melbourne didn't get a Hevra Kadisha till 1909. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, where did they bury people? How did they do things? Because every... Synagogue had its own arrangement with the cemetery and with the cemetery. So it was a very kind of uh, piecemeal process that people have to go through. It was Rabbi Dangler who kind of unified all of the people involved in that um, and created uh, Melbourne's Hever Kadisha. In fact, uh, it's kind of significant. Uh, rabbi, not much more concerned about Rabbi Dangler than the fact that he was, he lived for a thousand years and he was a rabbi for a thousand years at St. Kilda Shul, um, where uh, there are still uh, many, many people who remember him. Uh, the next rabbi I want to quickly look at is, uh, that's, that, that, and these rabbis are for various durations of the period we're talking about in the background to everything we're talking about. But it's a very, very significant a figure would be Rabbi Israel Brody. Now, Rabbi Brody, similar to, you know, uh, Friedman, and came out from that background, although he had higher qualifications than Friedman uh, and Danglo, and was a, a higher level of rabbinic ordination, uh, came out and was the rabbi of the Melbourne Hebrew congregation uh, from uh, the mid-20s to the late-30s. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm reminded, um, when you're nodding, I'm reminded that when I gave a talk similar to this earlier in the year at the museum, I was talking about one individual that I'm going to talk about tonight, and someone in the audience put up their hand and went, oh, that's my father. So just to show you how carefully I have to tread when I talk about individuals um, that we know are in uh, living memory. Uh, but Israel Brody uh, brought with him uh, a different kind of energy than the pure Anglo. Uh, he was much closer in some ways uh, to the European model. Um, but the extraordinary thing about Rabbi Israel Brody, apart from the fact that after he left Melbourne in 1938, he went back to England and then some years later became the chief rabbi of the Commonwealth and, and became Rabbi Brody, this immensely uh, important figure. But Rabbi Brody, unlike the other rabbis in Melbourne, uh, in Australia at the time actually, was in fact a Zionist. And in 1927, and this is important because it's unusual, we are going to talk about this in some detail during this period, it was not the norm to be a Zionist. Zionism at the time was still an idea. Certainly when Friedman started the Zion, first Zionist organization in Perth in 1900, it was an absolute fantasy. But even by Brody's time, when you'd already had several waves of Aliyot, and you had a Yishuv, and you had a Balfour Declaration, and you had a British mandate that had a kind of a, a recognition of some sort of purpose or some sort of Jewish settlement in Palestine, even then, Zionism was not an idea that was being signed onto by everybody as it is today. Today, it's almost heretical for a Jew in Melbourne to write to the... Australian Jewish news and say, I don't like Zionism, I'm an anti-Zionism, the whole idea is a nonsense. <laughs> and I was literally just imagining what such a letter would look like and how it would be responded to uh, in today's world. Uh, but in those days, Zionism was not a given. Israel Brody became the first active president of the Zionist Federation of Australia in 1927. And for those of you who were listening last week, don't call out, those of you who were listening last week, who was the first honorary president of that Zionist Federation of Australia? Monash. So Monash was the honorary figurehead, but it was Rabbi Brody who was the active president who pushed this consciousness of Zionism. And what is Zionism at the end of the day is the desire of the Jewish people to have a homeland in Palestine and ideally to go and live there. But even if you couldn't go and live there, you could support it. I have read articles, you know, when you read learned periodical articles like from the, the, the Australian, you know, Jewish hysteric, Historical Society, and you read these papers that, on, on topics, and some of them even say, you know, oh, Zionism in Australia doesn't have any really original flavour, it's all derivative. But I don't believe that. I don't think that's true. I think Zionism in Australia grew out of some very, very extreme and special circumstances that I want to look at in this period. This is a difficult period, 1930-1960. As I keep saying, it's a difficult period to talk about. You heard of Susan Rutland? Yeah? So Rutland wrote her MA thesis just on this period and just in New South Wales, let alone try to incorporate that into Victoria, whatever. It's a big period. But Israel Brody is in the background pushing things, but as the rabbi of Melbourne Shul, of, of Melbourne Hebrew congregation. Not as a lay leader, as we might see. He's no easy Liebler. This is a rabbi, and so it is rabbis who are the thought leaders of the communities in those days. And people took them seriously. And they listened. <sighs> rabbis dreaming. The fourth rabbi I want to mention, and I'm going to mention him briefly uh, because uh, 
He's not such a big player politically, but a very, very important person to have been in Australia in the background in this period is Rabbi Brody's successor at Melbourne Hebrew Congregation. Brody left in 1938 and he was succeeded by Rabbi Harry Friedman. And the reason I want to talk about Rabbi Harry Friedman for a second, and I met Rabbi Harry Friedman when I was extremely young, about three or four years old, and my parents were at a Zionist conference, uh, and I was taken by my father to meet Rabbi Friedman, who was sitting by the pool. Uh, Rabbi Friedman, just astonishing. Some of you would be familiar with the Sonsino translation of the Talmud. In the 1930s, in the 1920s and 1930s, the Sonsino publishing house produced one of the great monuments of 20th century Jewish scholarship. That was a translation not only of the whole Talmud, but of the entire Midrash and of the Zohar on the entire stratum of rabbinic literature, all the classics they produced in English, they were literally the art scroll of their day. And Rabbi Friedman was one of its most significant contributors, wrote the translation and commentary to several tractates of the Talmud. And you go, okay, well, someone had to do that. There have to be scholars who have to do that. What's so impressive about that? He did it from Melbourne! I mean, try and do that today from Melbourne. It's not easy. He did it from, he'd already done a few tractates, but in fact, it was Tractate Zvachim, I believe, that he actually translated uh, during the period that, can you imagine, that he was actually in, uh, in Melbourne. Then he left Melbourne and he went and he spent some time in America where he taught at Yeshiva University. And then he came back to Australia to be the rabbi at Central Synagogue in Sydney for a few years until he retired in the mid-60s. But that is a significant scholar and that shows the changing nature to some extent and the complexity and the depth of Australian Jewry and also the standards that they were starting to expect from their rabbis. The fifth rabbi I want to talk about uh, in, as a background to all this, <laughs> the fifth rabbi I want to, now, you've got to understand that obviously as we spoke about last week, in the early, well uh, after the turn of the, the late 19th and early 20th century, right up through the 19th and the 1920s, there were waves of immigration now from Central and Eastern Europe into Australia. Nowhere near the numbers that were reaching America, but there were quite a, few, quite a significant waves of immigration. At a time where it was still feasible to do that. Now, that means that Australia was opening itself up not just to your very proper Anglo-Jews and not just to your German Jews, but in fact, people a lot further east. And they were coming to Australia with a totally different conception of Judaism. They found the local Anglo communities quite alienating. And the local Anglo communities found them a bit smelly. And many of those Jews obviously different socio-economic conditions, different language skills, different skill sets altogether. Some of them had spent time in English-speaking countries, but, but, but often not, literally off the boat. There were tensions, and we're going to return to those tensions in a moment. But many of this, the, these Jews actually set up, and I'm going to talk, this is a massive topic, and there are people in this room who know a lot more than me in detail about this topic, but I'm just talking about its highlights. And that, of course, would be the fact that the real thriving, living centre of Jewish Melbourne before the 50s was in Carlton. Most of you would have heard of that. And there was, indeed, a thriving kind of Yiddish Leben going on in Carlton that was a transposition much more of the familiar patterns of Jewish life and of Jewish prayer and Jewish learning and Jewish rituals and kashrut and all the different things that pertain to a more kind of uh, uh, observant but also culturally Jewish existence were taking place in Carlton and the rabbi of course there were a number of rabbis but the rabbi most famously associated with that is of course Rabbi 
Gurevich. And you can tell if an audience says it like that, then you know that that is the one. Now, what's remarkable about Rabbi Gurevich, apart from the fact that he was obviously a remarkable individual in his own right, and I know that he came from, uh, I mean, he first of all came out to Australia really just collecting money for the Lithuanian uh, Vardi Yeshivot, the board of Yeshivot of Lithuania, but he ended up staying and uh, was the Rav of Carlton, the Av Bet Din. The, the Carlton had its own Bet Din. He was the head of that Bet Din for many, many years. And in the course of which he really became the first rabbi in Australia to engage in correspondence with some of the, what you might call the Gedolim, the great sages of Europe, Chaim Mozegradzinski and others with whom Gurevich uh, traded correspondence. Now, that correspondence itself and the matters that he was writing about and the questions that he was asking are of themselves extraordinary, an extraordinary reflection of life in Australia at the time, particularly life in Carlton, on all subjects of uh, Jewish law. There were actually some questions that, only because I studied this separately, probably the most remarkable question that was sent to uh, one of the great sages of Europe actually came from Perth, uh, because, um, you know this, Tony? The 1920s, there was a mikveh in Perth, and a horse fell in the mikveh. And they needed to know what to do because the horse had fallen in the mikveh and died in the mikveh. It was a whole thing, so they had to ride away. But I'm not saying that Rabbi Gurevich's questions were of the, know, of the same kind of caliber as that, but they were. Um, the the, 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 the halachic correspondence is fascinating. Rabbi Gurevich was a genuinely learned scholar in the East European model. This is something that Melbourne, that Australia generally had not quite seen. And of course, there were aspects of conflict between Rabbi Gurevich and the Anglo-establishment. Once again, a subject in itself. And the sixth rabbi I just want to mention before we launch on the other more thematic topics is, of course, Rabbi Herman Sanger. Now, Rabbi Sanger was from Germany. and uh, came from a very distinguished line of uh, rabbis. Um, and in recent generations for him, uh, those rabbis had uh, taken uh, a fairly lead role in the uh, movement of progressive Judaism in Germany. And uh, that was Sanger's background, that was his calling. But, I mean, he had an education that could have qualified him if he'd wanted to become an orthodox rabbi. Uh, but either way, he took, he got his rabbinic ordination. He was granted it in Berlin. He had the misfortune of getting rabbinic ordination in Berlin in 1933. And for the first few years that he, of his posting in Berlin at a synagogue, he would write that in those days he would have to wind his way on the streets past the Gestapo and the black shirts that were on the streets of Berlin. But he was by nature a person who could not stay still in the face of moral outrage. And he spoke out quite vociferously and put his name to various statements that quickly brought him to the attention. You have to go. You're allowed to have some notes because you're going to go. They've probably got nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about, but enjoy them. And That, that was a joke. And... Uh, eventually, in 1936, he received a phone call from someone who said to him, uh, you need to leave Berlin tomorrow. Not tomorrow night or the next day, but tomorrow you have to leave Berlin. And he very, very narrowly ended up uh, very narrowly escaped being, uh, being caught and would have been sentenced. He would not have survived. And he made his way to London. And in London, they said to him, there is a struggling progressive community in a place called Melbourne in Australia. 
And now that's probably about as far away from Germany as you could get. And Sanger took that job and he arrived here in 1936. Now, if you can imagine that there were conflicts and a little bit of alienation between Rabbi Gurovich and his rabbinic colleagues, imagine that times 10 on crack for Rabbi Sanger, because orthodoxy, Anglo-orthodoxy, controlled really the whole discourse of Australian Jewish outlook. There was no such thing as progressive or liberal Judaism in Australia. But there had been, because some of these waves of European migrants had been more familiar with progressive Judaism than Orthodox Judaism. Even the Anglo-Orthodox Jewish services they found dry and unappealing. And they weren't necessarily equipped, literally, in literacy terms, to deal with those services. So they had started a community called Beth Israel in 1930, but by 1936, after a few experiments at various spiritual leaders, they were seriously struggling. They were about to disband. They said, we'll give it one last shot. We'll try this guy Sanger from Germany. Sanger came out and within two years, he had managed to not only cohesively bring the congregation together, expanded it, but built their first temple in St Kilda. So he established TBI in 1938. An interesting year in Australian Jewish history. But throughout his career, and particularly as a background to what we're talking about tonight, Sanger was a remarkable advocate for refugees. Now, during the 1930s, it was only becoming aware to some people in this country that there were some very, very dark clouds on the horizon in Europe. By the way, when I say advocate, you know that he was called, he was referred to, Herman Sanger was referred to as Australia's greatest orator. And English was not even his mother tongue. His mother tongue was German. And who called him Australia's greatest orator? Bob Menzies, which himself was not a bad speaker. So just to show you the, the caliber that Sanger was operating at. But by the nine, throughout the 19th, look, I want to make one thing clear because I think that we need to um, cut some of the people I'm going to talk about tonight, we need to cut them some slack. Because I don't believe that it was possible for anyone to predict the Holocaust. Things were bad but no one believed they would get worse at every stage that they got worse. But by the late 1930s, and certainly by the time, you know, after the Nuremberg Laws, and then eventually by Kristallnacht in 1938, almost exactly 80 years ago, things were very, very grim indeed. And not until you get to 1939 and then 1940, you know, Poland's been invaded, Germany's invading France, they're going to take Hungary, they're going to take Romania, and the, the uh, uh, appalling abuses of Jews, and uh, I mean, I'm not even talking about 1942, final solution yet, but just the appalling reports that were coming out of Europe, uh, even those people would... You know, it, it seems when you read the things that people weren't necessarily collating what was actually happening. Unlike a guy like Sanger, who had seen it with his own eyes. Now, obviously, during the 1930s, there was a desperate call to the Australian government, now that we were kind of out of the Depression, to open up. There were only about, I mean, there were a few thousand refugees came from Germany. But there were calls, obviously, to open up Australia's doors to as many Jews as the government could accept. And many advocates on behalf of the Jewish community were talking about this, but many were not. Many were saying, we don't need those refos here. Australia is not going to take be able to handle all of this influx of people with no English, 
and different culture. The infrastructures of the Jewish community couldn't handle it. We have an established way of life here and we don't want it changed, thank you very much. With hindsight, we can't judge them. No question that with hindsight they would have said, you know, of course, if we'd known about the gas chambers, if we'd known about Hitler's full plan of extermination for the Jews of Europe, it would have been a different story. But no one could foresee it. But Sanger saw it. Sanger saw it. And not just in speeches, but with his own energies and practical hands, he helped refugees. Many refugees came here because of Sanger and also were acclimatized and acculturalized because of Sanger. And therefore, many, many actually were attracted to progressive Judaism because of him. Um, it's not my discussion tonight whether progressive Judaism is or is not a good or a bad thing or orthodox. I don't look at the Jewish world in that way. But Sanger was remarkable in his advocacy for the Jewish people in almost every... And of course, it goes without saying, he was a Zionist. Now, by the time, however, we get to the, 1930s, the late 1930s, 1938, 1939, the critical conditions that are existing in the world and in Europe, and as far as the Jewish world is concerned, it's not just one place. There are two critical areas in which Jewish loyalties and Jewish thoughts are being tested. One is Europe, and one is Mandate Palestine. On the one hand, we want to get as many Jews as we can out of Europe. On the other hand, those of us who support a Jewish home in, the land of, in, the Pal in, in Palestine want to get as many Jews as we can into Palestine. It seems an obvious fix. And who's controlling Palestine? The British government. And who are we loyal to as Anglo-Jewish Australians? We're so to criticise British policies in the... But, of course... <laughs> The waves of immigration, Jewish immigration that had come to Australia before then, in the decades before then, many, many of whom did not identify with this adherence to Britain culture. And many, many of them were Zionists. So the Zionist movements started to be more and more populated and controlled by Eastern European immigrants and their children. If you look, for example, at someone like, uh, I mean, I can't mention all the names. Some of you will sit there and you'll know names, but a couple of names are really stand out. If you look at like someone like Aaron Patkin, who, by the way, I believe started the Australian Jewish News as well. No? Who started the Australian Jewish News? Australian Jewish News started already before Aaron. Not 1935? No, it started earlier In that form? Australian Yiddish 11. Started as Yiddish 11. We know that Zionists were producing... The oldest copy that we have of the Jewish Union, it's not the first one, is the one that says that German Jewry are very worried about the fact that Hitler has just come to power in February 1933. So that's 33. I, 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 have, I have seen Patkin mentioned in relation to the, the Australian Jewish News in 1935. But he and people like Rika Cohen, Rika Cohen was uh, not uh, of European, so she was from here, but... Uh, they started this Hebrew language newspaper called Ivriya that uh, became an important organ within, uh, within the Zionist community. I'm, I'll, I'll refer back to it later when we talk about the Jewish day school movement and so on. British policies were seen as reprehensible by the Zionist elements in Jewish Melbourne. But the Anglos, who were loyal to the crown to a fault and who were, in any case, anti-Zionist, found this reprehensible that the British policies were being in, in Palestine were being criticised by Australian Jews. In fact, this led to such a crisis that um, the rabbi of the great synagogue, Rabbi E.M. Levy, who wrote publicly in criticism of the British government's policies and a pro-Zionist letter, listen to this, 
this is 1938 compared to 2018, who wrote a pro-Zionist letter criticizing the British policy in Palestine, was sacked by the Great Synagogue and sacked by Sir Samuel Cohen. Sir Samuel Cohen was a picture of the, he, he, he really belongs in that golden age we spoke about. Huge businessman, uh, public figure, president of the great synagogue, sacked the rabbi. That led to the appointment of Rabbi Porush, who came out after. And of course, the great outrage amongst Anglo Jewry that Rabbi Levy's and others, Zionist communications were causing, were being, these fights were being carried out in the public as well as the Jewish press. And the Anglo establishment, the Jewish Anglo establishment, had a very, very, very powerful advocate. In fact, you could scarcely get a better one. Because who was at the forefront of the anti-Zionist campaign in Australia? Sir Isaac Isaacs. And in 1938, let me remind you, that Sir Isaac Isaacs had just retired as Governor General, Australia's most important Jew. And he was coming out vociferously against Zionism. What was Sir Isaac Isaacs's problem? Because Judaism is a faith. It's not a nationality. And how can you create this kind of nationalist conflict? Not to mention the fact that what we're doing is brutally unfair to the Arab populations of Palestine. But what about diaspora Jews? What about Australian Jews? Where is their loyalty? How can you, have, how can you be loyal to two nations? As Australian subjects, we are loyal to Britain. We are loyal to the Crown. How can we... That, that surely has got to be compromised. What are we, Jews? Or are we Australians? He could not understand anything about being Jewish beyond it being a faith system. He was a product of that very thinking. Now I'll come back to Sir Isaac Isaacs in a moment. And, it was, and, and, and once again, you look at me like that, but let me tell you this. No, 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 I'm, I'm kidding. I was just saying that. Don't you? You're looking fine. <laughs> you have to understand what that means. This is no... Archi parchi from the boondocks here. This is Sir Isaac Isaacs. It, you don't get to be Sir Isaac Isaacs unless you are brilliant. He sat on the high court for 25 years. He was one of the great constitutional lawyers in the world. And when he argued on these subjects, he argued very, very cogently. He pulled a lot of people out of the Zionist movements by force of what he was saying. And we're going to come back to how that resolved itself in a moment. I need to just divert briefly, because um, if we're talking about those very, very dark years of 1938 to 1940, and the arguments that were being played out in the Australian Jewish press, not just, not just about Zionism, but about the whole refugee question itself. By the way, by the way, just a, a small point. Uh, Sanger wrote later about how alienated and embittered he felt about his relations with all the Orthodox rabbis. There was only one Orthodox rabbi who he actually became friends with. That, of course, was Gurevich. Ironically, the most from of all the Eastern European rabbis was any one of the rabbis who was prepared to be a friend with Sanger. I want to divert now, because we're 1938... And I want to talk about, and you all know this, so I'm only going to touch on it briefly, but we, if we're talking about highlights in Australian Jewish history, we have to talk about this. Because huh, in all of the effort to save the Jews of Europe, which was being carried out in Jewish communities all around the world, Australia had some unique contributions, and not all of them came from Jews. Kristallnacht was in November 1938. There was only one 
official protest about that anywhere in the world. And it happened here in Melbourne. And it was led by William Cooper, who was an Aboriginal rights activist. People don't realise that when Cooper led that march in the late 1930s, and remember in 1938, Cooper wasn't just fighting for his rights as a citizen of Australia, he was fighting for his rights to be considered a human being. Aborigines didn't get citizenship in this country until the 60s. But he formed the Aboriginal Rights League. And they led a march. He saw what had happened to the Jews in Germany on Kristallnacht, and he marched in protest to present a letter to the German consulate in Melbourne in support of the Jews of Germany. It's remarkable. And even more remarkable, people don't realise, but in 1938, at that protest, Cooper himself was nearly 80. And he led that march. And this is the 80th year since he did that. And last year, they actually, his grandson took a copy of that letter to the German government in Berlin, where they finally received it. So Cooper is, Cooper is remarkable. And that happens here. And although <laughs> I have no problem regarding that as a highlight of Australian Jewish history, the other amazing story, and once again, some of you have heard me talk about this recently. I'm just going to go over it briefly because it's, but it's, it's too amazing, it's too weird, and it brings up other associations that are important to us to talk about. And that is that you would know that... As you can imagine, as the clouds are darkening over Europe, many Jews around the world are trying to work out ways in which they can help them once it becomes very clear that something terrible is happening. How can we get Jews out of Europe and how can we get them somewhere safe? So they look around the world for places that have big tracts of empty land and of course they come across Australia. It's particularly spearheaded by an organisation in England, well, in England and other places, known as the Freeland League. And the Freeland League found Australia on the map and went, oh, there's a lot of space there. And not only was there a lot of space in Australia, the entire continent barely populated, but the Australian government itself at the time was saying, we need more people. So the Freeland League went, oh, let's approach Australian governments. So they wrote to the West Australian government and said, we would like to set up a city in the north of Western Australia, in the Kimberley, and bring in not a few thousand, over a million Jews to establish a civilised city in the north of Australia in the Kimberley. People make a mistake. They think that the Jews wanted their own state in Australia. It wasn't. It was to set up the infrastructure for a city. Even the West Australian government, the correspondents, were making conditions like people have to stay there for five years, etc. But the West Australian government was interested. And this was at a time when no one was aware that the Kimberley <laughs> turns out to have the world's largest deposits of iron ore, among the world's largest deposits of uranium, gold, and huh? diamonds, and, yeah, and importantly, fresh water. The Ord River holds the big, biggest amount of fresh water in Australia. This is, that wasn't even, those things weren't even on the table. Ah, the Kimberley. A few kangaroos, a few aboriginals. Sure, no problem. Let's set up a city. It didn't happen, for reasons I'll touch on in a moment, but in 1940, a representative of the Freeland League, Nachum Isaac Steinberg, arrives in Australia on behalf of the Freeland League. And you can see pictures of him in the 1940, 1941. He's stomping all over the Kimberley. He's looking this, would do this. 
Now, I don't know if you heard about it, but that project didn't take off. The governments were interested by the, to, before even the end of the war, Curtin had made it clear to everybody that that wasn't going to happen. But the Kimberley was not the only place where Steinberg was looking. When Steinberg was, oh, Steinberg himself, by the way, before he even gets to Australia, you could make a film about him. He was Lenin's attorney general in Lenin's first cabinet in Russia. He'd run away from, uh, from Russia. He ended up in England. He frumed up a bit, became the representative of the Freeland League, and he comes to Australia in 1940. He spends three years in Australia on this project. Governments were talking to him. Governments were open to his ideas. They were interested. Now, while he was here, while he was there in Perth, in Western Australia, it came to his attention that there was someone in Melbourne that very much wanted to meet him because they had another idea. This was a Jewish woman living in Melbourne by the name of Caroline Isaacson. Now, Caroline Isaacson had been born in Vienna in 1900 and she'd come out. She had married an Australian soldier who was quite a bit older than her. Her, her name had been uh, Caroline Jacobson. She married a guy called Isaacson and they came out and he brought her out to Melbourne. But she came from a very cultured family, came from Vienna, could speak several languages, knew how to do things, knew how to present herself, and above all, she knew how to write. And she went on, I mean, she's famous in her own right, she's interesting in her own right as being at the forefront of women in the field of journalism in this country. She's the first female foreign correspondent and then editor for The Age. She was a fascinating figure. By 1940, she was an extremely established journalist in Melbourne. And I wouldn't normally go into this, but you know how, like when they make movies, right? And in the movies, there's a love scene. And you all think, that's gratuitous. And they go, no, 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 no. It was necessary for the movie. So it's a bit similar here. I have to talk about this only because it kind of makes sense for the story. But she was very close to a young man uh, in his late 20s, about 30 years old, called Critchley Parker. Critchley Parker was a non-Jew. He came from a very well-established and wealthy Melbourne family press magnate, Frank Ernest Par uh, Parker, his father. And Frank Ernest Parker had fallen in love with Tasmania, and young Critchley had often been taken there on holidays, and the whole family was really all about Tasmania as this wonderful place. And Critchley Parker, who was basically in love with Caroline Isaacson, became impassioned with the Jewish people and deeply, deeply worried about the welfare of the millions of Jews in Europe, what was going to happen to them. And he told, he asked Caroline Isaacson to get in touch with Steinberg to invite him to Melbourne to talk about the idea of settling Jews in the southwest of Tasmania, in that incredible wilderness, and to set up this amazing city. So Steinberg comes to Melbourne, talks to Caroline Isaacson, writes to the Tasmanian government, and the Tasmanian government goes, thumbs up, brilliant. They were right on board with it. So they start making all these kind of discussions and arrangements. But a couple of years later, and especially once Steinberg starts making preparations to go back to Europe, Critchley Parker is getting more and more anxious about the state of Jews in Europe, and nothing's happening yet enough, fast enough, in Tasmania. So he decides to go by himself to the wilderness, to Bathurst Harbour, what it's now called, and to charter and create and put facts on the ground and to start locating this Jewish city of refuge that is going to rise like a jewel in southern Tasmania. A city that he envisaged would have up to two million people full of intellectuals and artisans and whatever he thought that Jews did. And, but he did not have much experience in bushwalking. 
but some guy took him on a boat, dropped him off and said, look, you've got some supplies, see how you go, wander around for a few weeks. If you get into trouble, just light a couple of fires, we'll see you in the distance. And Paul Critchley, after a few days, the weather turned foul. Uh, his matches got, he got lost, his matches got wet. He, oh, before he went to Tasmania, by the way, he was given a leather diary by Caroline Isaacson to write notes in. Anyway, he got sick. The weather turned bad, he got sick. And eventually, he spent the last few weeks of his life unable to move. He actually heard a boat in the distance because they did send out a search party to look for him. As he realised he was dying, he, in his tent, overlooking Bathurst Harbour, this city, which he called Poinduk. Poinduk is an Aboriginal word for a local duck. That was going to be the name of his city and it was going to be a whole integration between Jewish and Aboriginal culture and spirituality and he plotted out the city and he described it it's how it functioned its work and his last few weeks were spent filling his diary with this vision of this city and that was going to rise in Tasmania to save the Jews and he died 30 31 six months later they found him and they found the remains his remains sticking out of his sleeping bag and the tent had blown away there's a monument there today but they did find the leather diary and they took it back to Caroline Isaacson and it completely changed her life. She then threw herself totally into pro-Israel and Jewish causes. She actually went to uh, cover the Eichmann trial for the Australian press in 1961 in Israel. Who else did that, by the way? Who else was sent? Not from Australia, but who else was sent famously to cover the Eichmann trial? Hannah Arendt. She was there with Caroline Isaacson. This is, this is a, now, I thought, when I first researched this and looked at it, and it's going, I went, oh, that is such a phenomenal story and such an amazing um, story. Someone should write that as a novel. And then it transpires that I saw an interview a couple of years ago with Richard Flanagan, who has discovered the story and says that he's going to write the big novel about Critchley Parker. But it's something that you'll hear more about. It's coming out and it's a fascinating story about this boy that gave his life for the Jewish people. The Holocaust did not just kill Jews in Europe. It killed people that gave themselves up literally for the cause of the Jewish people. And that happened in Tasmania in 1942. Now, oh, and of course... I can't not mention one other very, very famous incident that happens during that period of the, of the early years of the war. And that, of course, is the horrendous and ultimately liberating in some ways, but overall horrendous story of the Danira. And that, of course, is the fact that England, I mean, once again, we can be cross at England for a number of things. They were at war. They did have a lot of pressures, um, but they rounded up all of the German alien citizens that they could find, including 2,000 young Jewish men, and put them all on a boat and transported them to Australia in horrendous, horrendous conditions. And only about a year later, and interred them all near Hay in New South Wales. I mean, they've made a movie about it. It's very, very famous. Following that, uh, many, of the, uh, many of them went back. Uh, about 150 of them actually made Aliyah to Israel. Quite a number stayed here. But it was <coughs> a significant event. Now, I know that it's sheer arrogance of the British to just send you know, these unwanted to the other side of the world to be in Australia. They hadn't done that for a hundred years, but they couldn't have done it unless the Australian government had also been a willing partner. But Australia didn't have its own foreign policy in relation to Britain. Whatever Britain wanted to do, Britain could do because uh, we were at the end of the day part of the empire and we were at war. But it's a, 
It's a story that some of you will know a lot more about than I do, but it's an important thing to realize. So all of those things, you know, your William Coopers, your Critchley Parkers, um, you, you, the, the Danira boys, all of those things happening between uh, 1938 and 1942, uh, just part really of the story of the pressures that were going on that this country was a part of, in the early years of the world, where the world was living with a great level of uncertainty. Now, <laughs> as if that uncertainty wasn't enough, in 1939, the British government, obviously under great pressure to open up Palestine for Jews to get there, brought out a series of policy statements, now famously known as the MacDonald White Paper, in which they said that immigration to Palestine was going to be limited to 75,000. This was a, a ridiculous fraction of the numbers that by now were need, was obvious we needed to get out of Europe. And of course that caused tremendous resistance amongst Zionist proponents in Melbourne and in Sydney, in Australia generally. And once again, it was considered an outrage by Sir Isaac Isaacs and uh, Sir Samuel Cohen, uh, Sir Archie Michaelis, other famous and very, very established members of the Australian Jewish community that British policies were being attacked by this. But they couldn't do much because Isaacs was like a bull terrier and he was an enormous force. In order to overcome Isaacs, you needed to find someone who was going to advocate for Zionism that was nothing short of a genius with impeccable legal credentials to be able to take someone like Isaacs on. And Australia didn't have that until 1942 when they finally did have someone who could do that because... Julius Stone was appointed as Professor of Jurisprudence at the University of Sydney and Julius Stone was an ardent, ardent Zionist and a brilliant and profound legal mind with impeccable credentials and in a series of of articles and speeches, and particularly a, an, an essay that he published in the form of a book called Stand Up and Be Counted, which came out in 1944. Uh, he basically uh, more or less demolished Isaacs's arguments and brought round large sections of the Australian public towards an understanding of the importance of Zionism and that it did not compromise or conflict with Australian identity and Australian loyalties, that Jews were perfectly capable of being loyal Australians and supporters of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, some people might think, oh, well, that's where the story stops. It was a debate carried out on the other side of the world in Melbourne, and that's it, that's fine. You know, every community had its figures, and that's what happened in your town and whatever. But that doesn't have much impact on anything else. But they would be wrong, wouldn't they? Because throughout the 1940s, throughout most of the 1940s, There was a politician in Australia, a Labour politician, Evert, who had been very close to Sir Isaac Isaacs. But after the war, Evert got elected as the President of the General Assembly of the new United Nations, which was going to oversee the vote regarding the mandate of Palestine and the creation of Israel. In those crucial and important years, it was Stone and other Zionist activists who actively pursued Evert and drew him away from Isaacs towards their position. Evert did not simply sit there and count the numbers. In the weeks leading up to the vote, 
about the creation of the State of Israel, Evert, who by now was in favour personally of this, lobbied aggressively with many, many countries to get the majority needed to create the State of Israel. So this debate that was carried out in Melbourne was not an irrelevant debate that happened on the other side of the world. It was a deeply influential debate that was not the only factor, but obviously one of the factors that led towards that famous vote in the United Nations in 1948. Seven. I was about to say seven. I was about to say seven, and then I changed it to eight. But you're right, it was seven. Now... Uh, the Second World War itself obviously saw a number of Jewish servicemen. Uh, obviously I can't talk about them all, but there are two that I think need to be mentioned in a highlights talk like this. I know. I know. It's hot and it's a long talk. Imagine how I feel. It is a... The first... Who would... Who would... Who... Don't, don't call... Don't call out. Don't call out. Just want to know. Put your hand up. I don't mean to patronise you or treat you like school kids, but it just makes it easier. Give people a chance to think. Because it's quite interesting. Who was the most decorated Jewish soldier in World War II? In World War I, we had our Monash. Who was the most decorated Jewish soldier in World War II? No, no, no. I will talk about him in a second. I will talk about him in a second. Huh? Paul Cullen. Major General Paul Cullen. Who, you must know that name. Who fought in Europe. He fought in Greece. But ultimately won his fame in the defence of New Guinea on the Kokoda Trail. He finished the war as a Major General. Now Cullen was not his first name. His original name. What was his original name? Cohen. He was Sir Samuel Cohen's son. The Sir Samuel Cohen that I spoke about earlier. Both of these decorated soldiers I'm talking about were the sons of people I have already mentioned in this talk. Why did Cohen, Paul Cohen, change his name to Paul Cullen? Why? That was a deliberate decision. Deliberate decision in case he got captured. Casey got captured by the Nazis. He fought in Greece. He changed it deliberately. He kept it after the war as Cullen. His children were known as Cullen. But he changed his name from Cohen in case he ever got captured by the Germans. A Jewish officer. <coughs> when Cullen came back, he went on to become the found, uh, founding treasurer, I believe, of Temple Emmanuel in Sydney. Played a big part in that particular project, but he was massively uh, decorated uh, Jewish soldier with a very, very strong Jewish identity who is linked to the whole Cohen family going back with the great synagogue and so on. The second one that I was going to talk about is, of course, as you mentioned, Peter Isaacson. Peter Isaacson was one of Australia's most decorated World War II pilot, fighter pilots. I was a bomber, you're right, not a fact, he was a bomber, and famously what? Flew under the flew, the only person to have ever flown a plane, a big World War II bomber, under the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Do you know why he was never court-martialed for that? Because he didn't crash it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Everybody wanted to court-martial him. Do you know why he was never court-martialed for that? Because for years after that event, there was still a demarcation dispute about exactly who was going to be responsible for that. Whether it was going to be, whether he, uh, who was going to be responsible for the, uh, for, for administering the punishment. Whether it was going to be the, the, the army, I mean the Air Force, or the Harbour Authority. And Isaacson wrote about that later. He goes, that's the whole reason. He goes, you know, but his famous motto of, you know, when in doubt, do the courageous thing. And Peter Isaacson lived a very long life. He only died last year. Now, Peter Isaacson is Caroline Isaacson's son. He was in his 90s. 
Carolyn Isaacs and son, and he died last year, which is one of the reasons why the whole Critchley Parker story is kind of coming out now. So one of the fascinating figures that the, the Jewish community had produced that played incredible parts in, in World War II. But the war finishes, and then we obviously have even more struggles over waves of immigration to Australia. Um, Jews were seen as white, but the question is whether or not Jews, are, I mean, now we're partaking in the, the general waves of immigration that are coming, and very, very many important people, uh, people that are refugees and immigrants that are going to go on to become extremely important in Australian Jewish life after, are coming after the war. These are the waves of immigration that are transforming the community as we know it now. In 1930, there were 23,000 Jews in Australia. By 1960, there are 60,000. So we're just almost tripling it, but we are changing the nature and the flavour of Australian Jewry as well. Uh, don't forget that um, I mentioned extremely briefly last week that one of the more bizarre episodes in Australian Jewish history, I haven't got time to go into, is the establishment of those early 20th century waves of immigration, some of which came from Eastern Europe, some of which came from Palestine, many of whom went to Perth and so on. But they were going to strange places, and there was a group of about a few families that set up an experimental Jewish agricultural settlement in Shepparton in Victoria. Now, that happened in 1913. The famous Shepperton's, uh, and so, you know, but when the Faglands, you know, uh, Beryl and, and Moshe Faglands set that up, they didn't, they weren't Lubavitchers. They, they had gone and met one of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's in the 19th century, so their name was on some list somewhere. And after the war, uh, when uh, uh, these, this, you know, the, the remnants of these Hasidic dynasties were looking for places where their followers could go, or maybe there might be people, Jews, that had some connection with them. These families started coming out to Shepparton in the late 40s. You know, uh, Vitsal Wolshansky, followed by, you know, the Serebranskys, the Klufkants, and all the famous families that make up the Babich. But I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, there is a topic that, 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 that is really as important as any other crucial to this period. By the end of the war, by 1944, we already have the establishment of the ECAJ, the Executive Council of Australian Jewry. That is really the successor to what had previously been called Jewish advisory boards. But Jewish advisory boards were still centred on the model of the synagogue as the nucleus of the community. This new idea that came out specifically from Zionist influence, and don't underestimate the influence of Zionism on the makeup of the Australian Jewish community over the 20th century, the idea that you would have lay umbrella bodies that would actually be the kind of official representatives of the Jewish community, it would no longer be synagogues, it would no longer be rabbis, it would be lay structures and lay leaderships. And that's very representative in what the ECAJ was about. And of course, many of those organizations went on to become dominated by Zionists and ultimately by people that had immigrated after the war from Europe and their children as well. But if you were to point to probably perhaps the most remarkable and lasting influential movement in Melbourne during this period, it would probably be the Jewish Day School movement. It is, I'm sure some of you are aware, but I'll remind you, that it is nothing short of remarkable the percentages of children that go to Jewish day schools in Melbourne. If you grow up in a Melbourne, you think that's normal. And it's definitely not. If you go anywhere else, if you go to the United States and you find a town that has 40% of children going to Jewish day schools, you would find that astonishing and remarkable. But in Melbourne, it's like 75% beyond anywhere that I've ever encountered outside of Israel. How did that incredible... And in the 1930s, people were writing going, you know, the Australian Jewish community has no future. It's a desert. They are backwards in their thinking, they are backwards in their perspective, there's no future here. 
And the only reason they could make those predictions is because they did not see the incredible rise of the Jewish day school movement. Now, attempts had been made to create kind of Jewish day schools at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. You know, they established Sunday schools and after schools and Shabbos schools and these types of things. But it was not until the 1940s, really after the war, where you could establish such a thing as a Jewish day school. And there are many, many people instrumental in that project. We don't have time right now to go into them. If we were to look at someone like Ben Sion Patkin, who I believe possibly more than anyone else, pushed forward the whole idea of the Jewish day school movement that ultimately led to the creation of Scopus in 1948. The astonishing thing about that, of course, is that not long after that, Patkin resigned. He was the president for the first few years of Scopus, Mount Scopus College, but he resigned because he became embroiled in an argument. I'm speaking up because it's raining. He became embroiled in an argument about what should be the language of religious instruction at Scopus. Should it be Hebrew or should it be Yiddish? Can you imagine such a debate happening in England? If you asked in England if they had a question, you know, should it be Hebrew, should it be Yiddish, the answer would be English. But in Melbourne, that was an issue. Obviously, Hebrew won out as the, as the state of Israel has created and the influence of Zionism. And then, of course, in the 1950s, the Lubavitchers, the Lubavitcher Hasidim that had been living in Shepparton went, ah, oh, maybe Shepparton's not quite for us. Uh, and they moved to Melbourne and they, and they established, you know, purchased properties in Hotham Street. They established Yeshiva College in 1955 and then the Lubavitcher Rebbe writes them and tells them they should have a girls' school as well. In 1956, Beth Rivka. Beth Rivka started in a building opposite Katanga. I've had entire lectures from Yossi on the beginnings of Beth Rivka. It is a fascinating story. Uh, and... Uh, Yavna starts in 1961, a religious Zionist school. Uh, in the late 50s in Perth, Carmel School. Mariah started in Sydney in 1956. All of a sudden, the idea that we should put these resources into educating our children is one of the most brilliant realisations and signs of maturity of the Australian Jewish community in all of its many locations. And of course, mid, the mid-70s, then you start seeing the, the rise of King David School, which was established in the late 70s, also on behalf of the progressive movement and so on. Now, there are two very, very unique schools on the extreme sides of that spectrum of the Yiddish-Hebrew debate. On the one hand, but both of them had started long before any of the others, because both Bialik, which was really uh, an outpouring of the Ivriyah Zionist emphatic Hebrew movement, and Sholem Aleichem, which was really a, an outpouring of the, of the kind of the Yiddish, secular Yiddish, Bundist, Yiddish-speaking communities, uh, were created in Carlton in the 1940s as kindergartens. But by the 70s they, and the 80s, they are already coming into the fore and have sufficient resources to create day schools. We are even now, as we speak, Right now, in Melbourne, today, this moment, seeing the mushrooming growth of even more Jewish day schools. Once a community is able to get to the point where they have 100 kids, bang, let's open a day school. I guarantee you all, there are Jewish day schools in Melbourne that you have never heard of. It's a remarkable thing, the Jewish day school movement. Whether or not their educational methods could be improved, there's no doubt, but it is a remarkable and influential movement that has forever changed, changed the face of Jewish identity in this country. I mean, there was a... Don't forget also that that idea itself met with considerable resistance at the beginning. People went, ah, oh, we can't have that. Jews need to be able to integrate. What's going to happen? They're only going to know Jews. They're going to have Jewish social networks. They're going to be completely ill-equipped to exist and survive in the outside world. And we know they were right. That was a joke. It was a joke. Was a joke. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, 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 it's a bit like Isaac's, Sir Isaac Isaac's argument. He was wrong, but he was also right. These issues never really went away. We still, ha we still haven't fully resolved the nature of 
of what it means to be a loyal Australian and loyal to the state of Israel. We don't live in a world yet where that conflict is present for us, but if it was, we would still have to make choices. I'm going to end on this interesting note because this is a note that I kind of, I got to, about a year ago in a discussion with Yossi, uh, he made me realise something and I thought, well, that's, that's really a perfect point to kind of bring this kind of talk up to. And that is the significance in 1961 of the Australian Marriage Act. Because until then, governments, for the, for the purpose of... Uh, the government decided that they were going to uh, administer um, an accreditation to celebrants. So you had to be an accredited celebrant if you wanted to perform a marriage. And that was going to be written into the Act, and it was written into the Act. But rather than deal with individual synagogues for accreditation, the government just wanted to deal with one overarching representative organisation on behalf of synagogues. So what was created was the Federation of Orthodox Communities, FOC. And that meant that the government could now just negotiate with one overarching synagogal body. Why that's interesting and why that's important, as I understand it, is because it meant that by the time we get to the early 1960s, synagogues themselves had already adopted the model that had been provided to them by the lay leadership. In other words, by now, synagogues were not the ultimate representatives of the Jewish community, but only in respect of rituals and religious observances. And even then, they couldn't negotiate with the governments or discuss things with governments as individual communities and synagogues. They had to be part of an overarching representative body. And the basic, the basic frameworks of that, that were established by the early 1960s, were already in place and have not significantly or fundamentally changed since then. We, of course, now in Melbourne uh, and in Australia generally, we now have about 120,000 Jews, they imagine. Uh, we have an incredible community with an incredible history. We still have a tremendous future of contribution ahead of us. The 1960s didn't stop our contribution. If you look, for example, I mean, and I couldn't not mention this, is that by the time we get to the late 1970s, we have another Jewish governor general. And Sir Zelman Cowan was not just another governor general. He was a governor general brought in at a time of tremendous constitutional crisis. Australia could, well, those of some of you might remember 1975. Australian political society was on the verge of implosion. Some were even talking about dispensing with the whole role of Governor-General. They brought in Sir Zelman Cowan as a stabilising, impeccably credentialed and respected force. And how many communities can say they've had two Governor-Generals? You've got people like famous Jews that spent, you know, their formative years in Australia, Sir Bernard Katz, Nobel Prize winner, Peter Singer, famous philosopher. But this community will still keep producing great contributors because perhaps what the last couple of hundred years have shown us is a kind of a model of how we can, as, as, as Monash would have put it, integrate ourselves both as true to our identity and our faith and our origins, but also great contributors as citizens of, of an amazing country that's only just now really beginning its own history. So thank you for listening to that and thank you for listening to the, the whole series. I know that it has been uh, a marathon, but there I have left out so much. And I know some of you are looking for the spectacular ending, but, you know, we'll, that will come, no doubt, at two o'clock tonight when I think of the way I should have ended this talk. Thank you.
So, well, yes. no, 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 I need to get on and do other things. You can do it. From, from 1965 till today, I, I would definitely sit and listen to that. Um, but, yeah, no, and also thank you to Yossi and to, and to others who have, uh, over, over the last couple of years, who have, I've been thinking about these issues, uh, put them together. I encourage you to read widely on this. Um, everything I've mentioned is simply a doorway. I, w I wanted to extract the main themes. 1930 to 1960 is a very important period because of the debates over Zionism, the debates over refugees, the way that our community was transformed by immigration both before the war and after the war. These are very, very meaty issues, but they also involve human dramas, like the story of Krishni Parker or William Cooper. These are actual human beings and, and, and the great work that is done on the ground by people is as important as the big thematic issues. So hopefully we got an insight into some of those and ultimately it creates the community that we have today. When I said that most of the important institutions in this Jewish community of Australia were established by 1961, I was not of course talking about Hamish biscuits because that didn't come in until the late 1970s and some of you will know it's really the only reason I live in Melbourne. But uh, that, that itself is part of the transformation that happened uh, after the war and so on. Well, I did, I, exa I did not speak about the huge waves that came into, from South Africa in the 1980s and 1990s and affected all communities. That would have to be in the, uh, in the, in the next talk. It really does need a fifth talk. <laughs>